Hey everyone. So this week we're going to spend a little time studying um, maps. Uh, and what I mean by a map is a uh, function. So a map of the sphere would be a function um, f from the sphere to the Euclidean plane. I guess I would want it to be uh, bijective, probably, or bijective uh, at least where it's defined. So it might it might be defined on the sphere, or maybe um, on some portion of the sphere. It's maybe the domain. To the Euclidean plane, I'm calling this a map because uh, you know if if you have a map if you have a function from a sphere to a piece of the Euclidean plane and flat piece of paper that looks like a map that's you know that's really what a map is it's a function like this um, we've already spent a lot of time talking about one particular map which is not a map of the sphere but a map of hyperbolic space I call this M and it's a function um, from hyperbolic space to uh, a portion of the Euclidean plane, which was the upper half plane, right? And we saw that you can learn a lot about hyperbolic space by looking at the map of hyperbolic space. And as you all know, the same thing is true for spheres. Uh, we use maps quite often, right? And that's just because it's kind of more practical to carry a piece of paper around than it is to carry a sphere around, like a globe. <clears throat> um, of course, the downside to both these maps, as you know if you watched the end of my last video, is that there's no way to create a function, either from part of the sphere or from part of hyperbolic space, into the Euclidean plane um, without having some distortion. So maps from the sphere or the hyperbolic plane always distort in some way or another. Distances and angles. Um, and, and what kind of distortion happens depends upon the map. Uh, by the way, so if you're following along in the book, what we're doing right now is chapter 14 we're going to spend some time on this week and this fact is problem 14.1 it's also one of the homework questions um, and what I want to talk about today is one particular map and then we'll look at another one on Wednesday but today I want to look at a particular one which is called gnomic project projection Um, a lot of times these maps from the sphere are called projections and that's because um, you can sort of think of them as like shining a light through a, trans a translucent sphere and looking at where the shadow goes onto a plane and so you're, you're, you're projecting this light from this light source uh, through the sphere onto the plane. So gnomic projection is a particular type of map that most of us are not super familiar with in our day-to-day -day life. Um, but it is actually used as, as, a, real, as a real map um, in, for, for navigational purposes. Uh, so like you know those ancient explorers that sailed across the sea, use gnomic projections for a lot of their maps uh, for, for seafaring. And the way gnomic projection works, uh, you imagine that your light source is at the very center of the earth, and so you're shining a light from here uh, through the sphere, maybe it hits this point on the sphere, and you continue until you hit the plane. 
Um, so this gnomic projection, I'll call it G, and it's a function from a hemisphere. In this case, you can see that this only makes sense for points on the southern hemisphere, right? Those are the ones that our map is defined on. So in this case, from the southern hemisphere. to the plane, Euclidean plane. Okay, and so in this case, uh, G sends this point here, I'll call it X, to G of X, which is just where the light source hits the plane. Or another way to imagine it is that this line here is a string, and um, you're attaching it um, you know, you're pulling it tight, and wherever it goes through the sphere, that's your point X, and then where it lands, that's where that's where X gets sent to. So this map sends X to G of X. Um, okay, so that's gnomic projection. And um, what you should do is kind of think about this for a little bit and convince yourself that it, it definitely distorts. And I mean, that's pretty easy to see. It's pretty clear that distances are not going to be preserved under this map. Uh, for instance, if I take two points that are that are pretty close to the equator, um, they're going to get sent to very different points on the plane. And so, you know, the distance between these two points, call them x and y, is much less than the distance between g of x and g of y. Um, I think it should be the case, yeah, I think it's clear that um, that not only is distance not preserved, it, it, it's always increasing. So the distance between points on the actual sphere uh, is going to be smaller than the distance between where those two points get mapped to. So distance is definitely not preserved. Um, angles, I don't think, are preserved either. Uh, I, you know, actually, not much is preserved here under this projection. So, why is it useful? Why is this is this a useful map? Well, it turns out. that gnomic projection so this this function g of x uh, preserves geodesics so what do I mean by that? I mean that it sends um, curves on the sphere, which are intrinsically straight, so we know those to be great circles, it sends intrinsically straight things on the sphere to intrinsically straight things on the plane. So it sends straight curves on the sphere, aka um, segments of great circles to straight curves on the plane, aka um, line segments. Okay, and so this is useful because um, even though distances aren't preserved, so your map, you know, if you're just looking at it, um, it's not going to tell you like how far apart. Uh, you know, you say, say you're using this map to walk, and you want to get from here to here, and this corresponds to here. This point corresponds to here. You're not going to know how far you're going to have to walk on the sphere. 
you know, this, this line here tells you nothing about that because distances aren't preserved, but you are going to know what's the shortest path. So if I want to take the shortest path from point A to point B, that's going to exactly correspond on my map to taking the shortest path from G of A to G of B. And so this is useful because it, it does tell you like what direction to travel in um, to, to go in the shortest path towards something. So this is a very useful map that way because, you know, one, one of the main ways we use maps is, is uh, to figure out how to get somewhere, and this is preserving um, the shortest paths. So the map does tell us what the shortest path is. Um, if you compare that, for instance, to the maps that we're more familiar with, like um, cylindrical projection, um, you know, the, the usual map you see, you know, hanging on walls and stuff. Uh, th this map does not preserve straight lines, does not preserve geodesics. And so the shortest path on um, the sphere corresponds, so a straight line on the sphere corresponds to a curve which is not at all straight on this map. So if I wanted to travel in a straight line along the sphere, I would travel along this curved, it would correspond to this curved path on the map. Okay, so gnomic projection is useful um, if you believe me that it sends great circles to lines. Okay, and so one of your homework problems this week is to prove that claim. So, um, let me draw a better picture. So I have a hemisphere here. And, you know, that's, that's the domain of the map. We, we can only look at a single hemisphere at a time. And it's mapping onto the plane. I didn't say it, but I should have said it. Where is this plane located? It's, it's exactly touching the... Um, the, the South Pole here. Um, and so here's what you need to show to prove this. Given some, let's say, A and B, two points on the sphere, um, well, there's a unique geodesic segment in the Southern Hemisphere connecting these points. So this is part of a great circle. Um, let's call it S. So you're going to look at where I'm making this larger. You're going to look at where S gets sent to. So we project from the center of the Earth. So here's G of A. Here's G of B. And we get some curve here, which is the image of, of this segment S here. So this is G of S. And so to prove the claim, you need to show that G of S is a line segment. Okay, so this is uh, one of your homework problems this week. If we were meeting together, it would be a group work problem. Uh, but I don't want to give any more hints than I already have, so um, I'm going to end the lecture for today and let you think about it on your own.